Ladies and gentlemen, we salute the great American, the great Zionist, and the great Jewish conservative, Charles Krauthammer. For those of you I don't know, I'm Eric Cohen, the executive director here at TICFA and the co-chair with Roger Hertog of this conference. And it's a great honor to be hosting this panel on the legacy of Charles Krauthammer. The very first paragraph in his collection of essays reads as follows. What matters? Lives of the good and the great, the innocence of dogs, the cunning of cats, the elegance of nature, the wonders of space, the perfectly thrown outfield assist, the difference between historical guilt and historical responsibility, homage and sacrifice and monumental architecture, fashions and follies, and the finer uses of the F word. Krauthammer was a man who took great pleasure in the richness of life, the grandeur of the universe, and the varieties of human excellence. He was a great-souled man with an even greater story. Krauthammer grew up in Montreal, where his father made him study Talmud at the highest level, though he would much rather have been watching Hockey Night in Canada. As an undergraduate at McGill, he helped overthrow the Maoists who controlled the school newspaper. And as the new editor, he imposed one rule that would serve him well his whole life, the free and open battle of ideas. The next stop was Oxford, where he studied political philosophy, especially John Stuart Mill and Isaiah Berlin, and then Harvard Medical School, where despite a tragic accident that left him partially paralyzed, he finished his medical training on time and began practicing psychiatry. But Krauthammer somehow knew that it was not the prescription pad, but the op-ed page where he would leave an enduring mark on the world. He found his way to Washington, first at the National Institutes of Health, then as a speechwriter, cover your ears, for Walter Mondale, and then as a political journalist, cover them again for the New Republic, and he eventually became the preeminent syndicated columnist in America, as well as a prolific essayist and TV commentator. Through it all, Krauthammer always believed that the beauty and wonder and mystery of life was more interesting than politics. But he also knew that artists and rabbis and chess players and astronauts could not defend themselves from the darker sides of human nature. Or as he put it, politics, the crooked timber of our communal lives, dominates everything because in the end, everything high and low, and most especially high, lives or dies by politics. You can have the most advanced and efflorescent of cultures, get your politics wrong, however, and everything stands to be swept away. This is not ancient history. This is Germany, 1933. This paragraph is classic Krauthammer. More hard-headed wisdom in just a few sentences than even great writers can compress in many pages. He was the true master, and America the Jews and the conservative movement were all lucky to have had him, and we all mourn for losing him too soon. Before I introduce our three distinguished panelists, I want to recognize one of the two people on earth who truly mattered most to Charles Krauthammer, his beloved son, Daniel, who is with us here today. Daniel, would you please rise so that we can thank you. Our discussion today will be organized around three loose themes. Krauthammer the man, Krauthammer the Zionist, and Krauthammer the conservative. And we are honored to have with us three of the very best people in the world to consider the Krauthammer legacy. Our first speaker will be Richard Lowry, the longtime editor of National Review, who has skillfully brought the flagship magazine of American conservatism from the age of Buckley to the age of new media. He also worked for Krauthammer many years ago as a research assistant. Our second speaker is William Crystal, one of America's most prominent and provocative public intellectuals and the founder and editor of the Weekly Standard for two decades, where many of Krauthammer's most important essays were published. Our final speaker will be Matt Continetti, founder and editor of the Washington Free Beacon, who has also been teaching a fascinating course for many years on the history of the conservative movement and the conservative mind. 
Each of them will speak for about eight to 10 minutes, leaving some time, I hope, for a conversation at the end. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure to be here with friends, especially given this phase my daughter is going through. She's going through this phase where she likes me. I know it'll pass. Uh, but she tries to bar me from leaving the house when I want to go to the office in the morning. And lately, she's taken to coming up for reasons why I shouldn't leave. And the other day, she said, Daddy, don't go out. People don't like you. <laughs> it's like, how, you're three years old. How do you know? Are you looking at my Twitter mentions? Um, I must say, I'm, I'm used to being the token goy at events like this, but this is the first panel I've ever been on where I am the token non-member of the Crystal family. We'll, uh, we'll have to have a panel one day with me and my father-in-law and invite Matt on it and see, see how he enjoys that. Um, as Eric uh, mentioned, I worked for Charles as his research assistant. It was my first job out of college, and I was terrified the entire time. Not, of course, because Charles did anything to make me feel uncomfortable. It's just that he was inherently such a formidable person. Charles reminds me a little bit of a, a story that's told about Governor Morris, one of the lesser founding fathers uh, of our country, a very jolly fellow. And he once accepted a wager that he could treat George Washington the way he would treat anyone else coming into the room. So the, the wager was that he would go up to George Washington slap him on the back and say, hello, General, you're looking mighty well this morning. And he went, he did it, he won the wager, and then went back and told his compatriots, I'm never doing that again. Um, and I, I didn't do anything particularly important for Charles. I did some light research, some fact checking, uh, some proofreading, some sort of gopher kind of tasks. But it has come, given the esteem that Charles has held in, to have uh, characterized the highlight of my career. I'll, I'll meet people and I'll tell them, yeah, I, I was, Bill Buckley selected me to be editor of National Review at 29 years old. You know, the thing he treasured more than anything else in this life except for his family. I've edited the magazine for 20 years. And my first job out of college was for Charles Krauthammer. And people say, really? You work for Charles Krauthammer? <laughs> Um, and my record working for Charles, I have to say, was, was a little checkered. Um, I, I, would, I would do a, a last proofread of his column at the end of the, these Thursday afternoons when it sent into the Washington Post, and one day I thought I'd caught an error, that I, I thought the word effect had been misspelled. It was used as a verb. Uh, Charles had written it with an E, and I was like, no, that has to be an A. I, I'm very proud of myself. I call up the copy desk of the Washington Post. You've got to change this effect to an A, uh, not realizing that actually you can spell effect with an E, and it can be a verb as well. And by the next morning, though, I'd realized my error. And being young and naive, I, I thought I had to confess my error to Charles. So I screwed up my courage, and I went into his office, and I said, you know, I'm sorry, I, I entered this error into your um, syndicated column. And I still remember it's emblazoned in my memory. Charles said, you know, he, of course he didn't get uh, angry or visibly upset, but he said, why did you do it? <laughs> and he said it with like the clinical detachment of a prison psychiatrist asking why you'd killed your mother. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, good times, good times. Um, but I, I worked for Charles before he was a TV star, and th this was pre-internet days when newspaper columns really mattered. One of my colleagues, Jay Nordlinger, tells a story of um, Clinton gave a speech, President Clinton, in 1995, and he was hoping all week that Charles would write about this speech, and Charles did. He bought his copy of the Washington Post and read it in his car while driving to work. That's just what a must-read Charles was. But of course, he got a much broader audience when he became a TV star um, uh, as part of the all-star panel on special report. And Charles is very unusual in that he developed a mass audience while never pandering, uh, which is, is very unusual. And I asked him once, why do you think you're such a compelling TV personality? And he said he thought one of the reasons is that he, he couldn't raise his voice. He was, uh, so he, he stood out for being so, so soft-spoken on TV, that might have been part of it. He was also, if, especially if you missed some of the dry wit, he was an incredibly glum 
presence uh, on that panel. And there was, a, there was an interlude when George Will was added, and, and I thought to myself, okay, to lighten up this panel a little bit, they've added George F. Will. Um, <laughs> but what it was fundamentally about was, you know, there's pundit smart, which is clever, glib, maybe well-read, you know, in the issue of the day, and then there's chess master smart. And Charles was chess master smart, was just, was not fair to the rest of us. Especially when that panel first uh, began, the, the other panelists would, would say things about the issue of the day. that per perfectly fine, um, seemed perfectly reasonable, and then Charles would go at the end, and they would all look stunned when he finished because they'd prattled on and Charles in uh, you know, several sentences had just cut to the heart of the issue with some statement that's just incredibly acute and deep. And that program really became the Charles Krauthammer show. Uh, Britt Hume, when Charles was gonna be on the panel at the end of the show, he would be sure to tell viewers at the beginning of the program, oh, we're gonna have an all-star all panel with Charles Krauthammer. When Charles wasn't on the panel, he would be sure not to mention it at the beginning, so people would watch the whole damn thing for 40 minutes, hoping to see uh, Charles Krauthammer. Um, and I have to say, when you were on that, uh, when you were a viewer of that show, you'd spend the whole time thinking, would everyone else please shut up? and let Charles talk. If you're actually on the program, you're like, Charles is never gonna stop talking. <laughs> um, but really what I think made him stand out in all of his work on TV and in print and elsewhere was that he was a fundamentally decent man. You know, on, on special report, if he'd make a mistake or if he'd say something that was overly harsh, sometimes he'd apologize in real time. They'd come back from a commercial break and he'd say, I should have uh, put it differently. How unusual is that? And unfortunately, most of the time he would not apologize for being overly harsh. Um, but he was also not just civil, but civilized, right? Civil is, is relatively easy. To be civil, you just have to be pleasant and not interrupt other people. To be civilized, you have to absor have absorbed our history, our culture, our arts, our values to have been refined by them and to reflect them. And that was Charles Krauthammer. Uh, I can't claim to have been personally close to Charles or his family. I was friendly with him for 20 years, but I can't tell you all the stories of his incredible uh, generosity to others, often uh, done privately to not get any credit or any attention for it. But I will tell you that one of the most moving and wrenching tributes I have ever heard was Daniel's eulogy for his father at, at his memorial service a few months ago. Bill Buckley once said of the great 20th century conservative Whitaker, Whitaker Chambers that his voice came from the center of sorrow, from the center of the earth. And on that day, that was Daniel's voice, it was the voice of a son who was utterly devoted to his father, a father who deserved every ounce of that love and regard. And if there's one thing you should know about Charles Krauthammer, it is that. Thank you very much. Hi, it's, it's good to be here. I, I like Rich Lowry's story about his three-year-old daughter uh, telling him not to go out because no one likes him. I've got to say that my 32 and 35-year-old daughters say the same thing to me. <laughs> Probably with more truth, uh, too. Um, let me just say a word, if, I, if it's appropriate, uh, on behalf, perhaps, of all of us here uh, to thank Minister Shuckhead for her statement of sympathy and solidarity. I, maybe I shouldn't say I'm saying this on behalf of everyone here since it's very risky to speak on behalf of 800 people, let alone 800 Jews. But I think we would all agree that uh, we really appreciate your, what your statement. It, it's, of course, we're so used to feeling sympathy and solidarity with Jews in Israel who are the victims of these kinds of attacks. And it is a little, I've got to say, unnerving almost to have a representative of the Israeli government to uh, have to make that statement about uh, what happened to Jews in America. On the other hand, I suppose there's a lesson in that too, and 
Um, so we very much appreciate what you said and your, and your, and your being here. Uh, Charles Krauthammer was a, uh, I'll say a word about his Zionism, but perhaps the first thing to say is that Charles Krauthammer was a proud Jew. I think in, in Jabotinsky wrote this uh, anthem for Beitar that never, I mean, it caught on. It was the Beitar anthem, but it didn't quite make it to be the Israeli national anthem. For some reason, they chose Hatikva because they wanted to have the most sorrowful anthem <laughs> possible. Uh, and instead of this kind of slightly fierce uh, Jabotinskyite anthem. But in uh, the uh, Shir Betar, the Jabotinsky refers, to, says, I think, a Jew should be proud, noble, and fierce. And I do think Charles Krauthammer uh, was, of all the Jews I have known, perhaps, uh, one of the proudest, one of the noblest, and one of the fiercest when it came to defending the things that he thought were worth defending, and one of those things was America. Uh, one of those things was was the state of Israel, um, and that I think is is key to understanding Charles's Zionism and his thought overall. Charles was interested in all kinds of aspects of Jewish thought and history. Uh, he was uh, Zionism is often divided into you know cultural Zionism, religious Zionism, political Zionism. Charles certainly had elements of all of them. He had a great appreciation for cultural Zionism, um, respect for religious Zionism. Uh, but I would say that in the spirit of Jabotinsky, that Charles was above all a political Zionist in the sense that he really understood that without the political success of Zionism, all the rest was problematic. And that was where he thought, I think he could make the most distinctive contribution. Uh, he was learned about Jewish things. He, he, wrote, he spoke and wrote interestingly about them, but it was in the defense of the state of Israel, where he was the central figure, in my view, among all the American writers and public figures, public intellectuals of his generation, that he really stood out and made a, a true contribution. It's a little easier today, you know, in, in the sense that conservatives, at least, are mostly, almost universally, pro-Israel, um, there's plenty of opposition, some on the right, more on the left, but and when Charles began making this case, one forgets it was not easy, it was not obvious that Republicans or conservatives were going to be that pro-Israel. And Charles helped shape one of the two major streams of thought in America in that direction, uh, which is a real accomplishment and a real service to the state of Israel and to the Jewish people. In that respect, he followed, in a way, in the footsteps, I don't think he thought of it this way, but uh, he followed in the footsteps of the great 20th century philosopher, Leo Strauss, who was a great student of many uh, thinkers, but also of Jewish thought, obviously, uh, who wrote a letter to National Review, since Bill Buckley was mentioned by Eric in the introduction, um, in, right after it started, this was in 1956, and Strauss was busy reading Plato and Aristotle and Maimonides and Machiavelli, and he didn't spend a lot of time writing letters to the editor of uh, periodicals, even fine ones like National Review. Um, but he went out of his way to write this letter because National Review in its first few months, and actually subsequent first few years, was not pro-Israel. And in fact, it was fairly, some of the contributors were fairly anti-Israel, not in an anti-Semitic way, but in a why is the U.S. wasting its time with this tiny state when we could be doing much better with the big Arab countries and, and so forth? And it's, plus it's started by socialists and you know, all kinds of other complaints about Israel. The letter is really worth, worth reading. It's a very interesting document. Strauss appeals to conservatives, makes a conservative case for Israel. It's not entirely maybe his own case because he's speaking to conservatives, so he adjusts his argument for his audience, but it's very interesting. And in the course of it, he says, um, he writes the conservatives for various reasons, should be appreciative of Israel uh, for various, as I say, conservative reasons. And he closes it with this. Finally, Strauss writes, this is in January, it's published, I think, in the January 1956 issue of National Review, so he writes it at the end of 55, when National Review's been going for less than a year. Finally, I wish to say that the founder of Zionism, Herzl, was fundamentally a conservative man, guided in the Zionism by conservative considerations. And then Strauss goes on, explains that Herzl was a political Zionist. Political Zionism was the attempt 
to restore that inner freedom, that simple dignity, of which only a people who remember, a peoples who remember their heritage and are loyal to their fate are capable. Political Zionism was the attempt to restore that inner freedom, that simple dignity, of which only people who remember their heritage and are loyal to their fate are capable. I always think of uh, Charles in that, in that context and his attachment to political Zionism. Strauss continues, political Zionism is problematic for obvious reasons, but I can never forget what it achieved as a moral force in an era of complete dissolution. And there I think uh, Charles follows in Strauss's footsteps in understanding that political Zionism is about more than mere power politics. Uh, it is the Jewish, it is the fulfillment of the hopes of the Jewish people, it is a refuge for the Jewish people, but it is more than that. Uh, Zionism, I think Charles Krauthammer, like Strauss, uh, defended Zionism because it was his own, but also because it was good. Uh, that the heritage that was being defended was a heritage that was a worthy heritage, a heritage to be proud of, and a state to be proud of right now. I think Charles Krauthammer in his defense of Zionism, and you can look at uh, his writings on this and the conversation I did with him and the conversation that I think Eric did, you did one with him, and um, uh, his writings about Israel and Jewish matters. Charles really transcended the usual uh, gulf or distinction between universalism and particularism. You know, either we're for something so abstractly that it doesn't have any grounding anywhere, or we're for something that's grounded somewhere with no reference to any uh, general principles or standards of judgment. And I think Charles, in his Zionism, shows us how to uh, defend a nation and a way of life in ways that do justice to its particularity, but also to, its, uh, to the fact that if one is going to be a reasonable human being, one has to judge by standards that aren't just particular that aren't just your own heritage is good because it's your own. Charles was an admirer of the American founders and of uh, Lincoln. He came to them late, as he explained actually in the conversation with me, uh, because he grew up in Montreal, so he knew all the kings and queens of Great Britain, and even more ridiculously, all the governor generals of Canada, I think, by heart, but they never bothered to study the American founding fathers much. Uh, so he learned all that later, and I think it gave him actually a deeper appreciation of the greatness of the founders and of, and of Lincoln. Um, Lincoln has this famous eulogy of Henry Clay, the, the great senator whom Lincoln uh, followed in, as a Whig in the 1830s, 40s, 50s. And Lincoln says in his eulogy of Clay, Mr. Clay's predominant sentiment from first to last was a deep devotion to the cause of liberty. He loved his country partly because it was his own country, but mostly because it was a free country. I think Lincoln might have exaggerated slightly the, the latter side of it. Uh, he wanted, in the 1850s, to lean against the dominant tendency of the time, especially in the South, which is where Clay was from, towards a kind of narrow nationalism, if you want to put it this way, severing the defense of uh, each of the, of, the, of the states and of the way of life from the principles of the Declaration. But Lincoln understood in this tribute to Clay that you love your country because it's your own, and you love your country because it's free, because it's admirable, because it points to excellence. So in that respect, I think Charles's political Zionism, uh, his patriotism about America as well, uh, remind us how fortunate we all are to be Americans and Jews, which means that we can most of the time, love our own, uh, but also love the principles that our own uh, nations are dedicated to and which they, which they strive to achieve, to complete, to live up to. Uh, and no one did more to help, I think, uh, both actually, uh, this great nation and the other great nation of Israel. Uh, no one did more to, in his own way to help both nations live up to their to the highest standards possible than Charles Krauthammer. So I'm the cleanup hitter, to use a 
metaphor Charles would appreciate. Uh, it's interesting to speak about Charles Krauthammer at a conference on Jewish conservatism because while Krauthammer was both a Jew and a conservative, he was the most unusual conservative. And I think that was kind of uh, mentioned in some of the talk, and so in my 10 minutes, I'll just kind of explain why that is and some of the fascinating paradoxes about the intellectual life of Charles Krauthammer. Uh, he encapsulated this in a joke he, he loved to tell, which was, he said, uh, he was often asked, you know, how did you go from writing speeches for Walter Mondale to appearing every night on Rupert Murdoch's Fox News? And his answer invariably was, I was young once. <laughs> and so for Charles, what's interesting is that um, uh, many of the in intellectual tendencies that he arrived at, at during his youth uh, persisted over time. And so this distinguished him from many American conservatives, and I'll explain a little bit. Uh, I believe Eric mentioned how uh, Charles's two chief intellectual influences were the philosopher John Stuart Mill, the founder of classical liberalism, and then Isaiah Berlin, uh, Mill's chief interpreter in the 20th century. Uh, those, the two books associated with Mill and Berlin were two of the three books that Charles would also always recommend when asked, you know, what book should, should I read? And interestingly, the third book was uh, the collected fictions of Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian fabulist. And it shows you the range of Charles's interests. But for both Mill and Berlin, uh, there were two main principles. One is the idea that truth emerges from the free competition of ideas. And the second, uh, that individuals should develop free from coercion or restraint. And these are distinct, I think, from the main thrust of conservatism, which tends to say that in addition to freedom, you need guides, you need traditions, you need authority, you need religious instruction. Uh, moreover, Krauthammer, who, as we say, was um, born here, but raised in Canada, uh, was really brought up in an Anglo philosophical tra tradition. And this tradition is slightly different from the, the traditions associated with the United States and American conservatism for its focus on empiricism, its skepticism toward grand and totalizing ideas and ideologies, and also its emphasis on the process of induction. You're not, you're not arriving at truths by, by deducting from axioms, but you're building up the truth through the examination of the evidence. Indeed, in Krauthammer's worldview, there are no final causes. There are no metaphysics. He was extremely suspicious of any metaphysics. And this included, in, to, to, to a, some degree, religious belief. Uh, he got into trouble once uh, because he was misquoted by Politico. But I'll read you the full quote, which is, he said, I don't believe in God, but I fear him greatly. And it kind of showed the, the nuance with which he approached religious questions. This very different I think, from a large majority of American conservatives who believe in some idea of a transcendental or metaphysical moral order. Indeed, he was very, extremely um, suspicious of metaphysics. And in his essay on uh, stem cell research, which is included in Things That Matter, he says, look, to just have an a priori objection to stem cell research, on the belief that it, because the, the single cell is a human, in sold human life, you either believe this proposition or you don't. The discussion ends there. That wasn't enough for Charles Krauthammer. And of course, this scientific mode of thought, um, which so permeated his worldview, came from his youth as well, and his love of science, beginning with a love of mathematics and physics, and then when he realized he wasn't a genius, and wouldn't it be the next Einstein in physics, uh, into medicine. And there's another uh, great Krauthammerian line, which is uh, people would ask him, uh, Dr. Krauthammer, how do you become a nationally syndicated columnist? And he would say, first, go to medical school. <laughs> uh, later influences, uh, I think, kind of tempered this scientific, logical, empirical, and inductive worldview. And these included uh, figures like Irving Kristol, uh, Charles Murray, uh, Mansur Olson, uh, Thomas Sowell, James Q. Wilson, and uh, indeed he mentions the contemporary writer Heather MacDonald, who could be classified as empiricists, uh, whose studies um, and kind of 
empirical findings about the actual results rather than the intentions of the welfare state over time drove Krauthammer to the right on domestic policy. He needed no such empirical findings when the discussion was foreign policy, however. Uh, he was a lifelong, um, one might say, liberal anti-communist. Uh, he identified himself with the tradition of FDR, Truman, JFK, LBJ, Hubert Humphrey, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and Henry M. Jackson. And it wasn't until indeed the death of Jackson in the 1980s uh, that Krauthammer found uh, himself allied with Ronald Reagan and, and made that final passage over to Reaganism. So what are some of the elements of this worldview? Well, uh, it involves the idea that the United States is fundamentally the guarantor of international security. That an alliance to defend freedom is in itself an intrinsic good. And that America needs to make uh, hard choices in the um, pursuit of human rights and foreign intervention. Now, uh, this emphasis on foreign policy and science may have led to Charles wrote very little in economics. Uh, and that I think is because he was not so dogmatically um, anti-tax and anti-welfare state as other American conservatives. Um, you know, Krauthammer liked to talk about, and of course he was chief uh, resident of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and then made his way to the National Institutes of Health. And um, he mused on this later in life, and he said, you know, in both of my professions, medicine and uh, politics, political commentary, I deal with uh, men who suffer from paranoia and delusions of grandeur. <laughs> uh, the only difference is that in Washington, D.C., these men have access to nuclear weapons. <laughs> I mean, his greatest influence, I think, uh, in addition to what Bill was just mentioning on the, the right's uh, view of Zionism, was also uh, clearly in foreign policy, which was his true passion. Um, it began with the debates over the nuclear freeze in the early 1980s. It developed into his support for the Rema uh, Reagan's support for anti-communist guerrillas in Central America and Afghanistan. That led to uh, one of Charles's great phrases, the Reagan Doctrine. Reagan didn't have a doctrine until Krauthammer named it. And then I think it led to one of his most important essays, especially in these times, which was his essay on the unipolar moment. And one of the paradoxes of Krauthammer, again, is that he named the unipolar moment, a moment in world history where America had unsurpassed global power. And yet he really didn't become a global superstar uh, until 2008, at where it could be argued that moment had passed. And indeed, in that essay in 1990, he says that in perhaps another generation or so, there will be great powers co-equal with the United States, and the world will and structure resemble the pre-World War I era. In 1990, on the eve of the Gulf War, the first one, that was not the case. America had unsurpassed power, and so the question was what to do with it. Krauthammer writes in that essay, an American collapsed second-rate status will not be for foreign, but for domestic causes. Later essays fine-tuned this uh, conceptual framework and described and analyzed uh, what he labeled the four major schools of foreign policy. These included isolationism, left and right, liberal internationalism, realism, a policy called democratic globalism, and then finally the fifth school was the Krauthammerian school of democratic realism. Uh, one last mention on his influence. I think he was very influential on uh, questions uh, that one might, one might call the bloodless crossroads where science and politics meet. And here, Charles was so instructive in bringing into public debate an idea of science and the scientific methodology. Uh, he liked to joke that he was the one columnist in America who read Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. And he read it twice, he said, just to, in order to reassure his readers that it is as incomprehensible as they thought. <laughs> and I think it was significant, he was a significant supporter of the United States space program and urging us for manned exploration of space. And he also served on President George W. Bush's Council on Bioethics. When I think his essay on bioethics, which is included in Things That Matter, is uh, well worth reading. In a statement to the Bio Council, of Bio uh, Council of Bioethics, uh, which is included in the forthcoming posthumous collection edited by Daniel Krauthammer, Krauthammer told the Council, quote, we want to bequeath to our children a world, a moral universe in which we think they ought to live. <laughs> 
And we may be jeopardizing the moral quality of that universe, the humanity of that universe, by cavalierly breaking moral rules we've observed for generations. In order, he wrote, continued, that people like me might walk. And Daniel notes in his introduction to this piece in the essay collection that uh, Dr. Leon Cass said it was one of the most profound things ever uttered in the council. So uh, how would Charles approach uh, the situation today? Well, uh, I need not remind the audience here, I think, that he was no fan of President Trump uh, or of the nationalist populism he represents. And the way Charles liked to tell the story was that um, uh, you know, when Trump announced his candidacy for president, uh, Charles was an immediate critic of it. Uh, around that same time, Things That Matter became a paperback, and um, the publisher tweeted out that it was a paperback, and President Trump tweeted out the publisher's tweet about the book and wrote uh, on Twitter, uh, Things That Matter by Charles Krauthammer, now in paperback. I quote, book sucks. And Kranhammer joked that uh, when the next edition of the collection came out, he was going to remove all other blurbs and just put that <laughs> on the back. Um, I, to say, uh, I think he would say that uh, what we need to do is preserve and defend the constraints or guardrails that guide or enforce uh, chief executives and the legislatures into making responsible and conservative decisions. Uh, that we also need to advocate for the pluralism for which Krauthammer stood his entire life. And that includes an acceptance of different positions, an ethic of moderation, and an openness to debate. And then I think very important for students of Krauthammer, which I include myself, the idea uh, of opposing moral equivalence in all its forms, and always drawing lines and making distinctions. That was really his intellectual method. And the title of his first collection, uh, from 1986, which is no longer in print, was indeed called Cutting Edges. And this is Krauthammer. He's always slicing, getting to the truth. i just close with uh, advice that's immortal and also included in this forthcoming collection. It comes from his 1993 commencement at McGill, his alma mater, where he gave three pieces of sage advice. The first, he said to the students, don't lose your head. The second, interestingly enough, was to look outward and he wrote, I quote, the dictum for this age should not be that the unexamined life is not worth living, but rather that the unlived life is not worth examining. <laughs> and his third uh, piece of advice was to save the best. Indeed, to save the best, and I think that now includes saving and teaching the life and thought of Charles Krauthammer, uh, whose influence on a rising generation of conservatives, both Jewish and non, is just beginning to be felt. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. Are these mics working okay? Good. So I'd like to start by picking up on a theme that Bill raised, um, which is the tremendous change in the conservative movement on the question of Israel. And I think it's fair to say that if you go to a big conservative event today, not even a Jewish conservative event, perhaps especially not a Jewish conservative event, um, and someone gives a speech about the alliance with Israel, the friendship with Israel, it's one of the great applause lines, rallying cries of the modern conservative movement. So I'm curious how each of you would make sense of this dramatic shift and how Krauthammer might have made sense of this dramatic shift in the place of Israel in the conservative imagination. Well, it has been transformative. And Bill, you read that letter to the editor of National Review. Also, I remember when I was working with Charles, you know, late 80s, um, early 90s, he wrote a, uh, a, a contribution to a symposium in National Review about Israel, where it was kind of up for grabs what our posture should be towards Israel. And I remember he expressed some frustration that this was even a question. But uh, Charles had an influence. Um, you know, Malcolm Muggeridge, the great British journalist during the Cold War, wrote about how it was just a, a, an intellectual error to think that the right answer to a question is inherently in the middle. Uh, very often it is not, and Charles was never on the middle on this question, it was at his most, I think, excoriating best on, on this question. I think politically, um, a big 
element of this has been the influence of evangelical Christianity within the Republican uh, coalition. And evangelicals are extremely pro-Israel. And then there's just the fact on the ground that this is a, a, a democratic ally of the United States. And whether you consider yourself a more hard-headed hard -headed realist, they're uh, an important security partner. If you put values first, they are a democracy in a region of the world with very few. I mean, it's obviously an important question. Other, I do think the movement of American uh, hawks, if you want, or internet, you know, the, the, the tough side of American foreign policy uh, under the influence of President Reagan, Elliot Abrams, many others, from a kind of, in my view, excessively or pseudo rail politique view of how Americans' interests could be advanced to a much more values-based foreign policy was very important because suddenly the fact that the Arabs had all the oil wealth and that you could, they were bigger and you could make all these cases for why getting along with them was more important than getting along with Israel, began to recede. Uh, the, Israel as a democratic, free and democratic ally, uh, coming from the same civilization, there was kind of a liberal element to this and a conservative element, if you want, the Judeo-Christian element, you might say, is the conservative element. The free and democratic is the more liberal element. They were combined in our thinking, and I think in American conservative thinking, and in, embodied in Israel. The other thing I would say is that after 9-11, there was obviously a sense of having, facing common threats and, and common enemies. And finally, I do think this, in contrast to, let's call it, EU leftism, or European universalist uh, leftism, uh, which was post-history, post-anti-historical, post anti-militaristic, obviously, thought we could sort of do away with war in a sense, uh, post-religious, post-nationalist. Uh, America and Israel are both nations that take religion seriously, as I said at least, that are based on, that are very interested in their own history and look to their own history for guidance, um, that respect military service, partly because they don't think, we don't think that wars are suddenly going away in the, in the 21st century, unfortunately, um, and understand the importance of uh, healthy patriotism as part of and connected to uh, an attachment to deeper principles. So I think in that respect, uh, America and Israel in a way have become more, or certainly American, most of American conservatism, some parts, to be fair, of American liberalism even, uh, are closer to Israel in a way because of the contrast on the one hand of let's just say a kind of author pure, you know, thuggish authoritarianism and jihadism on the one side or EU sort of, uh, um, you know, transcending all past history uh, kind of universalism on the other. Uh, the only thing I'd add is that I think uh, Charles being a realist um, and somewhat prone to uh, the half glass empty view of things would be more worried about developments in the Democratic Party than cheered by developments in the Republican one. And uh, of course, uh, we all watched uh, throughout the Obama administration as he, as he, he critiqued the Obama policy toward both Iran and uh, Obama's very critical posture toward the state of Israel. And then um, in the last uh, few years of his life, uh, during the 2016 campaign, uh, he wrote very eloquently on developments in the Democratic primary, including the rise of Bernie Sanders and uh, Sanders' uh, own extremely uh, critical views of the state of Israel. I think were he alive today, he'd be focusing very closely on, on that aspect of the problem. So Charles's weapon of choice was usually the 800-word op-ed, uh, but he occasionally wrote some big, longer essays that really defined key moments. Um, one, uh, Matt, you already mentioned, which was written right as the Cold War was ending, the unipolar moment. Um, in 2009, he wrote an essay called Decline as a Choice. And I wonder what each of you would say if he were writing one of these big essays now, trying to define the American moment, the geopolitical moment, what would it be called and what would he say? I'm not answering that question first, sorry. <laughs> You know, I thought you were going to mention another big essay he wrote that is of interest to people in this room that I've taught, actually, at Tikva. Uh, we've all taught, I think, and discussed at Tikva uh, sessions of one, seminars of one kind or another, which is his wonderful essay in the Weekly Standard, 
was that 98, I think? 98, at last Zion. Yeah. What's it, what? 1998. Right. What, the title was? At last Zion. last Zion, which was a wonderful celebration of the fact of the state of Israel, the nation of Israel, and as Matt was saying, since Charles, like all intelligent, sensible people, is kind of a glass half empty kind of guy, um, it was of what the implications of that are. If all the Jews in the world, if half the Jews in the world are basically are in Israel and half are in the United States, and the ones in the United States are intermarrying and declining in numbers, uh, not just because of intermarriage, and they're all in Israel, that's a wonderful thing, but it's a very small country and it's susceptible to attack, and we, there are these things called nuclear weapons and other forms of weapons of mass destruction, and in some ways it's an unbelievable historical gamble. This was Charles, inadvertent, not, not that anyone intended it, but we have ended up in a situation of both uh, fulfilling dreams that went unfulfilled for two millennia of the Jewish people, but in a certain way, putting the Jewish people and the Jewish future more at risk, Charles argued, uh, than perhaps we have been uh, for all the terrible things that happened to us <laughs> in exile for all those, all those centuries. So it's a very bracing essay, very thoughtful essay, worth really rereading and rethinking uh, more than at least every couple of years, I would say. Um, I mentioned the unipolar moment. That was followed by another essay for the national interest uh, called Universal Hegemony, and uh, in which he said that the goal of the United States in the, in the unipolar moment should be basically to uh, enforce our values and ensure that they are dominant in the globe and to undercut any potential competitor. And this is a very controversial position at the time. Um, shortly before Charles uh, under, underwent his surgery, I encountered him in the green room and I said, and Charles, I'm, I'm, I teach that essay to my Hertog students. And he, he kind of had his wry smile and he said, I was pretty ambitious with that one. And indeed, to plug the forthcoming collection again, uh, it's called The Point of It All, available for pre-order. I saw it was number one on Amazon, so it's good. Uh, there is a major unpublished essay, which I will not spoil for you, uh, but it, the title of it is The Authoritarian Temptation. And it is his sense to, to make sense of, uh, his attempt rather, to make sense of the moment that we find ourselves. Clearly, it would be a follow-up to the unipolar moment, and you mentioned the passage in the unipolar moment when he mentions when our power wanes and you'll have a return to, to more 19th century um, great power politics. I'd say on the question of Trump, the last time I had a public discussion with Charles was, was after the election at a National Review Institute event and I asked him whether the rise of Trump, uh, Trump's election had prompted him to change on anything and he said no. He hadn't changed his mind on one thing, and he said he still maintained, as he said during the campaign, that Trump was a rodeo clown, and his only regret about that phrase was that it might be unfair to rodeo clowns. So, last question, and then we'll, we'll adjourn. So, like many of the great intellectual leaders of the modern conservative movement, Charles had his own movement from left to right. Um, and I wonder, as you look on the cultural and political horizon today, you say any big issues that might mug people by reality today and, and, and prompt a similar kind of intellectual movement from the left to uh, some version of the modern right? Well, I think, it, I think it's uh, pretty clear the issue is free speech on campus. And I think we're beginning to see that with the rise of this so-called intellectual dark web of uh, many academics and social scientists who are men and women of the left, and yet because they are voicing opinions and um, indeed speaking of empirical findings that go against the dominant politically correct narrative on campus, they are hounded out, uh, they are fired from positions, uh, this includes in the tech industry, uh, and indeed in the case of Charles Murray at Middlebury College, physically assaulted. So I, I find when I, when I look at the thinkers today, many of them are moving from from a position of almost kind of default liberalism. If you think of somebody like the uh, Canadian uh, psychologist Jordan Peterson, not a psychiatrist, but a psychologist, um, he is ending up in a right-leaning position through no fault of his own. It's only through the developments um, in his native Canada, another commonality he actually has with Charles. 
uh, that, that somehow the, the, some of the greatest conservatives come, American conservatives come from Canada for whatever reason. But I'm not sure that comparing Charles to Jordan Peterson is entirely <laughs> uh, favor and appropriate. The, um, but uh, no, it's a very fluid moment. I think Charles was, I mean, was always willing to rethink things and always willing to be, not to assume that the inherited dogma of either side was entirely correct. He didn't actually uh, agree with every conservative point of view on uh, some issues, and he didn't, he didn't go out of his way to trumpet that either because it, it was only appropriate to raise it when that issue came up. Um, and I do think, but I would say I very much agree, authoritarianism, I would say. And there are, in my view, authoritarian threats on the left and on the right, and I'm not even sure how much sense the left and the right make anymore as divisions, and you know, if, if, if you look around the world, and um, there, but there are authoritarian threats abroad and authoritarian threats of different kinds, I believe, at home. If you've spent uh, 20 years, I was joking with someone who's attending this, 20 years on a liberal campus, you think the huge threat is from the campus left. If you're in other parts of the country, uh, and you go to a Trump rally, you might think the threat comes more from a kind of authoritarian, know-nothing populism of the right. And I think both are threats. And I think Charles would be extremely hostile to both. Charles believed in freedom. Charles believed in human freedom. It was the precondition for human greatness uh, and for everything that's worthwhile. And that's true of Jews and non-Jews alike. And I think he would be concerned about creeping authoritarianism of all sorts. I agree with Matt. I think it's the uh, madness coming out of the universities and on the campuses, which the, originally the new left arising in the campuses pushed a lot of intellectuals um, to the right. And there's free speech. There's also the subset of issues around uh, these Title IX kangaroo courts that have, have been created to consider um, alleged sexual assault or sexual harassment. You had a, a fairly prominent feminist writer at the Chicago area, maybe from Northwestern, and she wrote an essay about one of these cases at her campus, and her essay was brought up as a potential violation of Title IX, because she'd written about this in the wrong way. And you've had uh, uh, professors at college writing, at least anonymously, that they're now scared of their students, because they might say something innocuous, lose, lose, use the wrong phrase, and uh, lose their entire career. So I think that that has a major potential to, um, to be transformative in the thinking of, of some people who don't think they're naturally sympathetic to us. So the title of this session uh, is The Legacy of Charles Krauthammer. Uh, and before we end, I just want to mention three ways in which we're going to hopefully help uh, or can lend our support uh, to continue that legacy. Uh, one you've already heard mentioned, uh, which is the upcoming collection of his uh, essays, writings, uh, called The Point of It All, A Lifetime of Great Loves and Endeavors, uh, really brought out through the heroic work of his son Daniel and others. So we should all play our part and buy many copies of this book. Um, the, the second is we're working to try to bring out for the first time a, a collection of Krauthammer's essays uh, in Hebrew. Uh, I think this is a thinker whose influence uh, has been heard around the world. Uh, and it should be heard uh, in Hebrew and can have, I think, a profound effect on the conservative movement that we're hoping to try to help build over there. And finally, I'm very excited to announce for the first time um, the creation of a new fellowship uh, in Charles's name. Uh, one of the many things that Charles Krauthammer did was mentor and inspire young people, people that wanted to follow in his footsteps and contribute uh, through the strength of their own thinking uh, to the quality of argument and debate in America about Jewish issues, about Israel issues. Uh, he was America's great public intellectual. Uh, and through a strategic investment by the Singer Foundation and in partnership with the publication that we run, Mosaic, uh, we are launching the Krauthammer Fellowship, a two-year fellowship for people that want to write and think and argue at the highest level on issues of profound concern to America, to the Jews, and to the state of Israel. So we hope that we can continue. We hope that we can do our part, uh, as all of you, I think, can, to learn from Charles Krauthammer, whose legacy is long and whose influence has been great. Thanks to my panel. Thanks to everybody. <laughs>